drug dealers have always expressed their wealth through their purchases. In fact, people with money in general buy luxurious things such as yachts, cars, homes, jewelry, NFTs, mamalonas, or whatever as a means to flex on people. It's pretty common knowledge that sneakers are often used as symbols of social status. For sneakers, this all started back in the late 70s and early 80s when the dope boys was the rock stars and pushing weight meant something else. But before they started working the corner in their dope sneakers, we gotta give some context into how the drug trade even arrived to that point. Drug trafficking in the United States dates back all the way to the 19th century. From opium, to marijuana, to cocaine, a variety of substances have been illegally distributed throughout US history. During the mid-1800s, Chinese immigrants arriving in California introduced Americans to opium smoking. The trading, selling, and distribution of opium spread throughout the entire region. Opium dens, which were designated places to buy and sell the drug, began to crop up in cities throughout California and soon spread to New York and other urban areas of the United States, where you might find a dude laid out on the floor in a bow tie and pinstripe suit, big chillin', puffin' on an ancient substance. Before long, Americans were experimenting with other drugs like morphine and codeine. Morphine was especially popular for use as a pain reliever during the Civil War, which caused thousands of Union and Confederate soldiers to become addicted to the drug. Fast forward to the Great Depression, and underground jazz clubs in Harlem were often filled with weed and booze thanks to the prohibition now being a thing of the past. Shortly after, the 40s and 50s ushered in the recreational use of heroin, and it ruined the lives of many jazz icons like Charlie Parker and Billie Holiday. At one point, Lady Day was spending the equivalent of $10,000 a week on drugs. It was getting bad. And as the decades progressed, we saw nationwide drug abuse in the 1960s with the hippie movement, and then eventually arrived at the era of the pusher man, the 1970s, where our look inside the drug dealer sneaker closet begins. You see, up until about the late 1970s, drug dealers weren't really rocking sneakers. They was wearing pimp suits and heavy mink coats. Imagine pulling up to your connect's house and he opens the door like this, cane in hand and all. Sneakers in the 70s were actually worn by mostly poor people and when wealthy people or affluent people wore them, it was usually just for like sport activities, recreational activities. The actual status symbols were these flashy suits and that's what drug dealers actually wore. But at some point in the late 70s, the drug trade became a 24 hour operation and entry level street drug dealers began working the corners. And this is where the platformers and Stacey Adam boots were left behind for a more casual look. Not only could they not afford the flashy stuff, they were less obvious and more comfortable in bell bottom jeans, Puma Clydes and Converse. It's kind of funny to think that the Puma Clydes made it on this list because they're the signature model of New York Knicks legend Walt Frazier who is known for his 1970s pimps outfits. Enter the 1980s and the birth of sneaker culture and hip hop paves the way for some of the most recognizable drug dealer sneakers to this day. The Gucci Tennis 84. During the early 80s, Gucci decided to create their very own version of the tennis sneaker, taking cues from the Adidas Rod Laver Super and similar silhouettes from that period. Gucci released an ultra expensive alternative made in Italy with premium leathers and nylons, complete with the unmistakable Gucci bicolor detailing. The tennis shoe was intended for obviously rich people of the excessively materialistic 80s. The Gucci tennis quickly became a status symbol of wealth and the most desirable sneaker for any hustler on the rise. Fun fact, Jay-Z's S. Carters that he did with Reebok was heavily influenced by the Gucci tennis 84 and it's basically like a 100% a rip off of that shoe. Um, but I think it makes sense, you know, Jay-Z growing up a hustler in Marcy Projects, I think it's dope. Um, I like the S. Dark Carters better than the, the, the Gucci tennis shoes. The Bally Competitions. Back in 1985, Slick Rick and Dougie Fresh released the song La Di Da Di Di and gave us a peep into what was fly on the streets of New York during that era with the line, fresh dressed like a million bucks, threw on the Bally shoes and the fly green socks. A quick glance at the album cover and you can see Dougie Fresh and the crew dipped out in Fila and Bally sneakers. A look that many people wanted in the 80s, but not much had the money to afford. Except, of course, if you were a crack era drug dealer. Alright, the Fila Tennis Low and the Fila FX100. Speaking of Fila tracksuits, I know Fila was a big deal back in the day too. Fila was also producing tennis shoes, and these were actually attainable, 
Unlike the Gucci stuff, from the Bronx to Harlem, you could see people imitating their favorite rapper or neighborhood hustlers in Fila Velour and classic Fila heritage like the Tennis Lowe's and the Fila FX100. I remember Nacho once told me that Fila was like Gucci to him. Fila had clout back then and I can see the upcoming dope boys rocking these for sure. The New Balance 990, the very first version of the shoe. The New Balance 990 was the first sneaker to retail for $100 and over in the DMV area of the country, hustlers were taking note. The first sneaker to ever reach a three digit price point? The dope boys had to have them. Thanks to the shoe's comfort and low profile, drug dealers preferred the New Balance 990 for spending long hours in the street attending to their customers. It's a hustler's classic to this day. Shout out to everybody who subscribed to the channel from the DMV. Pro Keds. As much as the Converse Chuck Taylor is considered the footwear of choice for gangsters on the West Coast, on the East Coast, a lot of cats were wearing pro keds, mainly because they were more affordable and the aspiring hustler didn't have the money to shell out for some Gucci 84s. In the 80s, pro keds were a staple on the streets of New York and it wasn't long before they seeped into hip hop culture. Fun fact, co-founder of Rockefeller, Dame Dash, bought the rights to pro keds back in 2004. Rockaware even released a collab with pro keds, which I remember seeing everywhere in high school. Are pro keds underrated? Let me know in the comments down below. The Adidas Superstar. All right, I'm putting this shoe on here, but really, it's all Adidas everything, from the Gazelles, the Adidas Top Den, to the Adidas Form. These were all rocked by New York hustlers in the 80s. It was the next level up from Pro Keds, and if you had the loot, you got to wear what was fly at the time, which was the Adidas tracksuits, jewelry, and most likely, a fresh pair of Adidas Superstars. Peep these fire Diodoras that Nacho got for 20 bucks and gifted to me. Anyways, this video is sponsored by Nacho Average Finds. That's right, we are sponsoring our own video. And what I wanted to tell you guys about is our Patreon. Uh, we've launched a Patreon. If you don't know what Patreon is, it's like crowdfunding for creators. And on our Patreon, we give exclusive access to our private sneaker Facebook group with 5,000 members. Um, it's really fun. It's a really cool community. And Nacho and I worked really hard to build this. You also get exclusive content, videos, exclusive podcasts. And we do giveaways and uh, we even do live streams. We have like a group member spotlight where we uh, highlight somebody in the community and we interview them for an hour and they show us their collection live in the group. And it's, it's just a lot of fun. And uh, I would love for you guys to check it out. So for as little as two bucks a month, uh, you can get started at www.patreon.com slash notch average finds. I'll put the link in the description so it's easier for you. And I really appreciate it. That's it for my plug. Let's get back into the video. The Nike Cortez. Okay, let's take it over to the West Coast. In the early 90s, the Nike Cortez was a common sight on the feet of Cholos. The infamous Nike shoe was a dead giveaway that you were causing trouble in the streets. And in gangs, oftentimes drug operations were run by petty criminals who ran the distribution of the gang's drugs business. It was also sported as a way to signal allegiance to a certain gang by way of the colorway of the shoe. There were navy blue nylon pairs, black and white pairs, and blood red Cortezes. To this day, I don't think I'd feel comfortable walking around certain parts of LA with this sneaker on. The Reebok Classic and the Reebok ExoFit Low. The Reebok Classic and the Reebok ExoFit Low were all popular sneakers on the streets all throughout the 80s and 90s. Not only were they fly, but they were literally the definition of a sneaker. These shoes were so low key that it was easy to be sneaky in them, especially the black pairs. Some even came equipped with gum bottoms, which made them perfect for withstanding the long hours out on the block. These two sneakers are no question a dope boy essential. The Nike Air Max 95. The Air Max 95 was once a sneaker that was highly sought after by your local dope dealer. For real, the OG colorway is iconic. Trust me, I would know, bro, I was on the block. <laughs> this sneaker was so infamous in certain cities like London that the UK police force literally listed the Air Max 95's footprint as its second most recorded footprint on crime scenes. As for the number one sneaker on that list, the Nike Air Max Limited. These were released in 2002 and are supposed to be kind of like an evolution of the original Air Max 90. They feature a massive 270 air bubble in the heel and for some reason this sneaker, the Nike Tailwind 4 and the Air Max TN are all highly sought after by criminals in countries like the UK and Australia. The Air Max TN specifically is basically Australia's Nike Cortez, off limits. Unless of course you're pushing weight and jacking cars, mate. The Nike Air Force One. Can it get more dope boy than a pair of fresh, crisp Nike Air Force Ones? Look, we all love the Air Force One and we all wore the Air Force One. 
But it all started with the hustlers on corners in New York neighborhoods like the Bronx and Harlem. Originally designed by Bruce Kilgore as a revolutionary basketball shoe, the silhouette quickly moved from the courts to the streets and was favored by drug dealers as the crack epidemic tore apart East Coast inner cities. Dipset's Jim Jones put it like this, Air Force Ones was the first drug dealer's dream. By the early 2000s, the Air Force One became a pillar of the dope boy's dress code. Fun fact, while not so much a drug pusher sneaker anymore, the Air Force One in an all black colorway might indicate that you're ready to do some dirty work. The black Air Force One has been the subject of memes all over the internet and for good reason too. All right. As we wrap up this video, I'd like to say thank you to all the OGs in our Sneaker Enthusiast Facebook group, many of which actually live these eras and were kind enough to share their opinions and thoughts on the subject of this video. If you'd like to join this private Sneaker Facebook group, head on over to our Patreon and sign up today to get access to not only the group, but a ton of other perks. With that being said guys, we are out of here. Peace, much love. I really appreciate you guys watching. Love you guys and see you guys next time. Peace.